Welcome once again. In this study, we're going to look at the use of the term the oil of gladness, what it means, and uh, what the conditions are so that we can enjoy the experience of having the oil of gladness. We'll start out by turning it to our Bibles and opening up in the book of Psalms to Psalm 45 verse 7. Psalm 45 verse 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest it wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Here is the mention in Psalms of this phrase, the oil of gladness, and you'll see that it is what God anoints with, and you also see that there are conditions Therefore, God. Because of something, therefore God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Above thy fellows. <coughs> it's originally a prophetical statement about Jesus Christ, but uh, it applies to his people and his bride as well. When we turn to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, we find the verse again brought forward into the New Testament setting. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Once again, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, once again, there is a set of conditions. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This oil of gladness. This is wonderful. A treasure, special, glorious. Once we're born again of the Spirit of God, new creatures in Christ, the New Testament tells us something wonderful about the anointing that we receive. 1 John 2.27 But the anointing which you've received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you, of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. There's a lot can be said about this, because when you're born again and you have the Spirit of God, you're born of the Spirit, you do have the same anointing. This same anointing teaches you all things and his truth and is no lie. It has taught you, it taught you about the truth of Jesus, the need for you to repent from your sin, the fact that God has given you faith, that the word of God is true. These things come from him, but this same anointing, if you're going to be honest about it, will keep you uh, on the way in the truth. But today let's look at the fact that the anointing abides in us. We've received it and this anointing abides in us. This anointing of the Spirit of God. If we go back to our first two scriptures in, in Psalms and Hebrews, we see that there are conditions of this flow of the oil and joy of gladness. Oil is often depicted in the scriptures as flowing. Flows over us and through us. 
The conditions are simple. You have to love righteousness and you have to hate iniquity. You have to desire and want and long to obey and please God. You have to hate and turn your back on sin and lawlessness. It's this desire uh, to walk pleasing to God, this desire that you have not to sin, not to offend God, not to be of the world, not to be of the flesh, not to be of the devil. It's this love of walking righteously and acting righteously and being righteous. Of course, you can only be righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his grace and through his truth, but it is a practical, real, living righteousness. And you have to love it. And by the same token, you have to hate iniquity. A lot of people hate iniquity, but the, the place to hate iniquity is, is when it's in yourself, in you. You've got to hate it in you. You've got to turn your back on it. You've got to always repent of it. You've got to want it out of your life and you want to be rid of it. You've got to love righteousness in your everyday life and you've got to hate iniquity and lawlessness and sin in your everyday life. I mean, how easy is this? Well, for a born-again spirit-filled, filled with the spirit. Christian, if you're born of his spirit and you're born of him and you're a new nature in Christ and all things have become new, as you let Jesus be your life force, this will be part of you. Loving righteousness and hating iniquity will be part of your life. Of course, it's got to be practical in you first. That's where it matters, your life, my life, me, walking righteously, me, hating and turning back and turning away from and having nothing to do with sin and lawlessness. It's true holiness, it's practical holiness, it's loving a kingdom of God, it's wanting to put the kingdom of God first in my life, it's living for Jesus practically day by day in his presence in his glory, in his power. This is victorious Christian living. In him. The real problem is that we do not hate our wickedness. I mean, sometimes... We act as though we hate wickedness in everybody else and in the world and we're quick to point it out, but we don't really hate it in ourselves. And, and what's more, we excuse it. We have excuses for it. I think the major difficulty is that we think that our life is our own, that it belongs to us, that it's ours to do with as we like. People don't have the foggiest idea of what this next verse means in everyday terms. Because we think that we have rights, that it's our life. I don't know how anybody who can support, uh, you know, the uh, determinating, that's a nice word for it, of unborn children, uh, as though uh, other people have a right over that life. Or uh, people take their own life and think they've got a right to it because it's theirs. It's not. Our life does not belong to us. Even if we're not saved, it really doesn't belong to us. And once we're saved and know Christ, it most certainly doesn't belong to us because we've been brought with a price. We should really have an understanding about this because uh, we're debtors not to live to ourselves but to live to him whom to know is life eternal. Here's a scripture that causes a fair amount of people to stumble. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 to 20. What? 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are brought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What, he says, don't you know? You're not your own. You do not belong to you. You do not own yourself. You don't have uh, these uh, rights to do with it as you please. You're brought with a price. So because of that, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. You most certainly do not belong to yourself. You belong to God. And, and as God's, we are to please him as God's in the fact that we belong to him. We are of God. We are to please him. We are to seek him. We are to do his will. Not just have an intention of doing his will. We are to do his will. We are to walk in his ways. We are brought with a price. We are not our own. We are God's own property we're owned paid for brought we belong to God we do not belong to ourselves get used to the idea you belong to God the things that you do in your life belong to God the things that you have in your life belong to God. The things that you aspire to in life belong to God. You belong to God. You are not your own. How difficult this is for many people to grasp. You are not your own. You do not belong to you. You belong to God. You are brought with a price. And what a price. Another aspect that needs to be considered is, do you need to mourn? Now, what do I mean by this? Well, in Isaiah 61 verse 3, we read this. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The oil of joy for mourning. Mourning over what? Well, mourning over your sin, your, your disobedience, your failure to submit yourself to the will of God to walk in his ways, to understand his heart, to be motivated by him, to have his viewpoint. Do you mourn for the wrong things that you've done? Does it really worry you, or do you just sort of gloss over it and say, oh, well, you know. I mean, does it make you sick? Does it make you feel sick in the pit of your stomach? Are you truly sorrowful? I mean, godly sorrow. Do you mourn when you disobey, when you sin? Or do you just sort of write it off and think somehow it doesn't really matter because somehow debt's all forward paid or something? Does it trouble you? Because you are supposed to walk in his goodness and his mercy and his love and his joy. You are supposed to walk. You've been created, born anew, a new creature in Christ, to leave the world and the old ways behind and to please God. And when you don't please God, well, when I don't please God, when I know that I've sinned, I mourn, I have sorrow. It leads me, this godly sorrow leads me to repentance and faith. And praise God, I ask the Lord to forgive me, and he does, but... I do mourn it. I don't just brush it off. The oil of joy for mourning.
So I exhort you, oh, get this oil of gladness. Join the sons of oil. Be someone who honours God with your life. There is oil of gladness that flows down and fills the life of people who love righteousness and hate iniquity in their own heart and life. There is a boundless flow of oil. Zechariah, in his visions, he sees these trees flowing oil into the golden candlesticks, a constant supply of oil. Many things can be said, but <laughs> start with this. Want to be as free from sin as Jesus can make you. Want you to, to live as holy as you, you can, because grace and truth comes in Jesus Christ. Enjoy the true holiness, living for God with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength. And I tell you, there will be oil of joy and oil of gladness flowing over you, filling your heart, filling your life, anointing you and blessing you. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>